In this lecture, we'll learn what a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram is and how we categorize stars. In the early 1900s, a Danish astronomer named Hertzsprung and an American astronomer named Russell independently decided to make graphs of stellar properties. These graphs revealed previously unsuspected patterns among the properties of stars and ultimately unlocked the secrets of stellar life cycles. What Hertzsprung and Russell plotted was stellar luminosity versus spectral type or temperature. We call these plots Hertzsprung-Russell diagrams or HR diagrams. The luminosity on the vertical axis is given in units of the sun's luminosity. Since there is such a wide range of stellar luminosities, we keep the graph compact by making each tick mark represent a luminosity 10 times as large as that of the prior tick mark. The spectral type on the horizontal axis represents stellar surface temperature. On an HR diagram, the temperature decreases from left to right. Each combination on the HR diagram represents a unique combination of spectral type and luminosity. For example, our sun is spectral type G2 with a luminosity of one solar luminosity. On the HR diagrams, stars near the upper left are hot and luminous, stars near the upper right are cool and luminous, stars near the lower right are cool and dim, and stars near the lower left are hot and dim. An HR diagram also provides information about stellar radii. Remember, a star's luminosity depends on both surface temperature and surface area. For two stars to have the same surface temperature, one can be more luminous than the other only if it is larger in size. For two stars with different temperatures to have the same luminosity, the cooler star must be larger to keep up with the luminosity of the hotter star. Stars do not fall randomly throughout the HR diagram, but cluster into four major groups. Most stars fall somewhere along the main sequence, the streak that runs from the upper left to the lower right of the HR diagram. Our sun is a main sequence star. Stars in the upper right are called supergiants because they are very large in addition to being very bright. Just below the supergiants are the giants, which are somewhat smaller in size and lower in luminosity, but still much larger and brighter than the main sequence stars. Stars near the lower left are small in size and pure white in color because of their high temperatures. These stars are called white dwarfs. Astronomers also assign each star a luminosity class, which describes what region of the HR diagram the star is in. The classes are designated with Roman numerals 1 to 5. Luminosity classes 1 to 4 are giant stars, and luminosity class 5 are main sequence stars. For example, to describe our sun, we'd say it's a G2 luminosity class 5 star. This tells us the temperature and the fact that the sun is on the main sequence. All the stars on the main sequence have something in common. They are all fusing hydrogen into helium in their cores. The mass of the star determines both the surface temperature and luminosity. The hottest and most luminous main sequence stars have a high mass. The coolest and dimmest main sequence stars have a low mass. This orderly arrangement tells us that mass is the most important property of a main sequence star. The fact that mass, surface temperature, and luminosity are all related means that we can estimate a main sequence star's mass just by knowing its spectral type. For example, any hydrogen fusing main sequence star that has the same spectral type as the sun must have about the same mass and luminosity as the sun. This relationship holds only for main sequence stars, not for giants, supergiants, or white dwarfs. A star is born with a limited supply of core hydrogen and therefore can remain as a hydrogen fusing main sequence star for only a limited time. This is called the star's main sequence lifetime. Stars spend the vast majority of their lives on the main sequence. Massive stars near the upper left of the main sequence have shorter lives than the cooler and dimmer low mass stars on the lower right of the main sequence. 
Even though more massive stars have more hydrogen to start with, they fuse their hydrogen into helium so rapidly that they end up with shorter lives. The smaller stars are simply more fuel efficient. Our sun will spend a total of 10 billion years on the main sequence fusing hydrogen into helium. A 10 solar mass will only spend 10 million years on the main sequence. A much smaller star, one with a tenth of that of the mass of the sun, will spend 100 billion years on the main sequence. This is longer than the age of the universe, which we know to be about 13.8 billion years. To sum up main sequence stars, high mass stars are large, blue, bright, and short-lived. The low mass stars are small, red, dim, and short-lived. Giant and supergiant stars are nearing the end of their lives. They have already exhausted their supply of hydrogen in their central cores. At this point, the stars puff out their outer atmospheres, becoming larger and more red. We will talk about giant stars in more detail soon. Giant stars are enormous. For example, Aldebaran in the constellation Taurus and Arcturus in the constellation Bootes are both more than 10 times as large as our sun. Betelgeuse is an enormous supergiant with a radius about 1,000 times that of the sun. Giants and supergiants eventually run out of fuel entirely. A giant star with a mass similar to that of our sun ultimately ejects its outer layers, leaving behind a dead core in which all nuclear fusion has ceased. White dwarfs are these remaining embers of former giant stars. A typical white dwarf is no larger in size than Earth, but has a mass similar to that of our sun. Procyon b is one such example. Not all stars shine steadily like our sun. Any star that varies significantly in brightness with time is called a variable star. Certain types of variable stars cannot achieve balance between the power coming out of their core and the power radiated out to the surface. These stars expand and contract as they try to find a balance. Most of these pulsating variable stars inhabit an area called the instability strip on the HR diagram. The most luminous of these stars are known as Cepheid variable stars. They are significant both because they are bright and because their periods of pulsation are closely related to their luminosities. Cepheids have played a key role in helping us establish the distances to many galaxies beyond the Milky Way. We'll discuss Cepheids and their role in cosmology later in the semester. That's it. I know we covered a lot, so get yourself a mocha or something good, and I will talk to you again soon.